Mike and I uh, want to thank you guys for jumping on. And uh, you guys, this has been a, another what, week or so of great basketball talk. And uh, today's going to be a great talk today, man. We've got some two good speakers, heavy hitters. And uh, Matt's been great uh, helping us out, too. Matt's been moderated. And we'll let Matt take over from here. But thank you guys for jumping on again. And if you guys have any questions, Matt would also mention it, too. But feel free to jump, uh, add it on the chat, raise your hand or so, and Matt will call on you so we can kind of get the uh, questions going and we'll answer as many questions as, as we can. All right. Sweet. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's jump right in. Our first guest uh, I'm excited about. Um, extensive experience. Started with the Sydney Kings. Um, uh, spent some time with the San Antonio Spurs. Was an assistant coach at UT San Antonio. He is currently the uh, pro personnel scout for the Utah Jazz. Um, I remember meeting Shannon at the very first uh, Asian uh, Asian coaches social ever. Um, so relationship is dated back a while. Um, so excited to hear what he has to say. Without further ado, Shinton Y. Thanks, Matt. Uh, really excited to be on. Um, and it's a good day for the Jazz as we got a win against Memphis. Uh, so. It's uh, extra incentive to uh, try to be um, uh, provide some good insight for you guys. And um, what I'll do is I'll, if Matt, if you don't have anything else that you want to kind of hit me with, I can go straight into my PowerPoint, and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, hop right in. All right. One second. Okay, um, look, once again, uh, thanks to everyone uh, who's jumped on board. Um, excited to be here. Uh, quick thank you to the Jazz and Dennis Lindsay for uh, allowing me to get on this platform and just talk about my experience, my path to the NBA, and just scouting at the pro level. Um, I want to give you a real um, good look at what I, you know, how I got there. You know, I want to be. Uh, able to share my experience, talk about the highs and lows, the right turns, the wrong turns, um, and the U-turns that I had to take in order to get to this, uh, to this stage. So um, what I wanna say is there is rarely a straight path to success. Uh, usually, you know, every goal that you wanna reach, there's some adversity. So uh, the guys that do have the straight path or the guys and girls that have the straight paths, to the end goals, usually the lottery winners. So it's, um, you know, I wanna be just as real as possible and I'm gonna take you through my journey, then I'm gonna to touch on the uh, scouting aspect of what I do, and then we'll have a bit of a Q and A. Uh, there might be the occasional bad word thrown in there. Uh, so I apologize in advance, but I just wanna keep it real. Um, just a heads up, I will not be talking about uh, any other players and other teams. The NBA is very big on tampering, so um, please uh, just keep your questions to uh, scouting. And if you do cross the line a little bit, I'll let you know if I can or cannot answer any questions. Um, okay, so let's go ahead. So, like I said, I'll touch on my background in scouting and Q&A. And then I'm gonna break down my background into my basketball background. Uh, my approach and philosophy, what was my in, staying connected from the outside looking in, getting back in, staying in, we're trying to stay in. Okay, so I'm originally from Australia. Um, I have had people here in the States, you know, ask me where I'm from, and I'll tell them I'm from Australia, and they will tell me, oh yeah, I've got a friend from New Zealand. And it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's like me uh, going to Matt and saying, where are you from? And he says, from California. I said, yeah, I've got a friend from Idaho. You know, that's the kind of look, you know, you might get from me. It's kind of like, what's wrong with you? So anyway, Australia, um, I uh, was born and raised there. I started playing club basketball there when I was 12. I coached my first team, my brother's team when I was 13. Uh, I did not play college basketball. Uh, I did not play professional basketball and 
the highest level I played was I trained with a Division II team for a year. And uh, so uh, it just goes to show that you don't need to uh, have been a player at any high level. You can come from overseas. You know, it, if you really want to, you can, you can find a way um, because uh, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. But um, what I'm going to do now is go into my approach and philosophy and uh, just go through uh, about six or seven things that I, I try to um, use as my driving uh, that drives me. So um, okay. be willing to volunteer and work for free initially. Uh, there's no paid jobs right away when you have no experience. Um, it's just, you gotta find ways to get in. It's not what you know, it's, it's who likes you. Networking is so important. So you need to get out there and meet people, uh, develop relationships and just, you know, try to try to just, you know, keep in touch. And uh, that's, that's so key. Um, be respectful to those above and below. So it's not like you, you're trying to meet, you know, a head coach uh, and, or a GM. You, you gotta be uh, networking with people above and below, you know, the student managers, the GAs, uh, the interns, because one day, you know, those guys are gonna be rising up too. So uh, just relationships with everybody's key. Uh, it's okay to have a, a fuck you list, those that didn't believe in you. And so this is a scene from uh, Billy Madison, Adam Sandler, basically. He, uh, he calls Steve Buscemi's character and says, look, I'm sorry for being a jerk uh, when I was younger. And Steve Buscemi says, yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And he goes to his, his list of people to kill and he, you know, he scratches off uh, Billy Madison's name. Now, I'm not saying you have a people to kill this, but you know, you're gonna find something to motivate you. There's gonna be a lot of people who tell you, you can't do something. You're not good enough. Why are you, you know, why are you dreaming of that? Okay, so, you know, believe in yourself. And, you know, one day if I ever write a book, that fuck you list is gonna be on the first page. Um, don't hesitate on an opportunity. If, it, if your gut says yes, because, you know, if you blink, maybe gone forever. You know, ultimately, time waits for no one. And um, a good example is I had a friend. Uh, he, he said, I want to get in the NBA. I said, well, I'm going to dinner with two guys tonight. They might be looking for an intern in the video room. And he said, well, you know, I don't know if I can make it up there. And I said, dude, you got four hours. It's, it's a 30-minute commute. So that really told me, like, okay, he wasn't really, you know, dead set on this is, this is what I want. So. Anyway, after that, the opportunity never came up again. And, you know, so don't hesitate. If you really feel like there's a chance, just do it. Um, there's, there's a quote from uh, Bobby Axelrod in Billions. If you don't take risks, you will always work for someone that does. I, I assume everyone wants to be a boss one day. So, you know, take the risks. Um, you know, make sure that you uh, do your homework, but, you know, I think, you don't take risks you always kind of be doing what you do and that's okay for some people but if you if you want to get somewhere um just do it uh go hard or go home you know when i when i talked to steve initially about doing this presentation um i said give me three weeks because i really really wanted to put some work into it so you know i i didn't want to wing it i thought this was a good uh, platform for us to uh, really discuss things um pay it forward Look, I've had a lot of good people who have uh, helped me along the way and they've never asked for anything in return. So make sure, you know, if you can do something, pay it forward, help someone else. And uh, finally, uh, just a, a quote that I love is uh, from um, Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, it's a great movie if you haven't seen it. So uh, what we'll do is now, what was my in? Okay. It's um, 97, so it was a long time ago. The under-22 World Championships, uh, Turkey has a guy named Hito Tukulu. Uh, this guy you should know, China had a 7-4 guy. His name was Yao Ming, super skinny, but could really shoot and really skilled. And then Argentina had a guy named Emmanuel Gin Ginobili is what they used to call him. It's uh, so Manu Ginobili, okay, fourth best player on his team. Uh, the rumor is that 
San Antonio were going to either draft uh, Lucas Victoriano, his teammate, who was a point guard, or Ginobili. And the theory was that Pop would never play a European point guard. Well, a year later, they drafted Tony Parker. So, but anyway, worked out well for the Spurs and Manu. Um, moving forward. Okay, so what was my, what was my in, that sliding door moment? And um, so I'll go back. So I was volunteering at this tournament. And so there was a game coming up. Uh, a guy asked me if I wanted to go uh, a ride to the game. I said, you know what? Uh, sure. And they said, but I got to stop and get some cigarettes. And I, you know, I'm not a, so I'm not a smoker. So you know what? I'll, I'll wait. You're good. So then I got a ride with someone else, my, my supervisor at the time. And um, generally uh, the seat I was going to sit in was on the baseline. It was a real good seat. But um, what happened was, well, I didn't want to just leave uh, my supervisor. So I went and sat with him and uh, it was pretty high up, but it was okay. There was a bunch of American accents. And so what happened was uh, I started looking around and all these guys had notepads. And then um, this one guy behind me was with his son. And uh, you know, his son is like talking and he's like, hey, what's, what's this, uh, what's that constellation on the Australian flag? And you know, all the scouts didn't know. So I just, I said, hey, that's the, uh, it's the Southern Cross. And um, then I, I started talking to this guy a little more. And he, I said, you know, who do you work for? He said, San Antonio. And I was, I was like, oh, that's cool. And um, so we talked a little more. I tried to, I, and I, you know, I heard that he used to work for Kansas under Larry Brown. And, uh, you know, we can, can continue the conversation. At the end of the night, uh, he gave me his business card. And his name was R.C. Buford. And uh, he was a scout for the Spurs. In 2002, he was named the general manager. And in 2020, he is the CEO of Spurs Sports and Entertainment. So he's done okay. Uh, I was very fortunate, very blessed to uh, just happen to sit in front of RC that night. And that, you know, that was my sliding goal moment. Um, so we stayed in touch. I, I sent a lot of emails on doing a lot of scouting reports for him on Australian players. In 2000, he actually invited me over to the States uh, he said, you know, come over for a vacation. So I did. I stayed with him. And, and on the very first day, he said, what are you doing? What's, you know, you're, you graduated. Well, what's going on? And he, he said, do you want an internship? And I was like, well, yeah. he said, well, it, didn't, it doesn't pay anything. And I hesitated. And I was like, I think it turned him off because I didn't commit right away. And after that, we never talked about it for the next two weeks. It was a good vacation, but I went home to daily life. So a year later, I would learn that he offered an internship to another guy, Sam Presti, um, who was, so graduated 2000 Emerson College in 2007, named one of the youngest GMs in the history of the NBA with the Seattle Supersonics, and currently executive VP and general manager of the, of the OKC Thunder. Um, Sam is very intelligent. Would I have, say, if we had switched spots and I had taken an internship, would I still be, you know, would I be the GM of the Thunder? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, he's really good at his job, but, you know, again, it, uh, you know, it, it happens and we all have different paths. So, um, and to top that, in 2012, I was getting married. I invited RC to my wedding. And when I told him the date, he said, look, I'm sorry. Sam's getting married that day too. And I was like, oh, son of a, anyway. So RC was very generous with his gift anyway, but I saw uh, Sam a year later in Vegas. We, we joked about it and he, he apologized. And I said, look, dude, you got him three championships. So that's, that's okay. So anyway, um, moving forward. Um, in 2001, I, I was, uh, you know, I was at home. I was, I was working in corporate, and I just, I was, I wasn't happy. And then I had this, uh, just at 4 a.m. in the morning. I got on my computer and I, I wrote RC an email. I said, Hey, look, do you have anything internship? I'll do anything. I was, I just, I just wanted out. Um, and he, uh, he didn't respond. And two weeks later, I received an email from this man, 
uh, Brett Brown. The, uh, he was the head coach of the Sydney Kings. And he basically said, look, RC, uh, let me know that you're, you, you're trying to get into pro hoops. Um, look, you can come up to Sydney. Uh, I've got no money. Uh, you won't be on the bench. You work from nine to 12 and uh, you need to figure it out. This time I said, okay, I'm in. But I didn't hear from him for uh, maybe three, four weeks. Uh, I told RC and RC is like, just get up there and then show up. I'm like, I can't do that. You know, like Sydney is not that close. Um, so anyway, I, we figured it out. Brett got back to me. I, I moved up there. Uh, I, I tried to call him 10 times the night before the first practice until he actually answered. But uh, it was good. Um, so now, you know, he's the head coach of the Philadelphia 76ers moving, you know, moving forward. Uh, but he was, um, it was really good. He gave me a lot of responsibilities with the video. Uh, he's, a, he's a really tough coach, demanding. You know, he played for Rick Pitino at Boston uh, University. And, uh, you know, he cut me no slack. But it, things went really well. He, he actually wanted me to come back for the next year. And then he jumped ship. He went to the San Antonio Spurs. So uh, they brought in another coach, Brian Gorgian, who was, um, you know, originally from Los Angeles, the winningest coach in uh, NBL history in Australia. and. Um, so he, you know, he was, he was hard. You know, I, I had to earn his respect. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. Again, once again, I had to just work real hard. Uh, but I learned a lot. Uh, and then we got to training camp and um, that went well. Uh, and then I, um, well, I, and now he's currently the head coach of uh, the Hawks, which is well, formerly Illawarra Hawks, where uh, a future first round draft pick uh, played last year. So we get through training camp, and then one morning I'm at work. Um, I get a call from uh, RC, and he was like, hey, we got this Chinese guy, Meng Batia. We just signed him as a free agent. Can you come over and interpret? I'm like, whatever. Like, why are you calling, it, calling me? I'm in Australia. There's got to be a lot more Mandarin speakers in, in the U.S. and Texas in general. He said, look, uh, can you do it? I said, look. I can order off a menu, and otherwise I'm, you know, I can't. And he said, well, you know, I tried to offer you a job. I heard you did, you know, did a good job in Sydney. And, uh, but you know, hey, you know what? Um, it is what it is, another opportunity missed. I'm like, gosh, you know, like, what am I not doing right? Well, I did take Mandarin in first grade for a year and I hated it. So, you know, that's on me, that's my fault. Okay, so moving forward, uh, I, was, I stayed with Sydney for three years. We won three championships. It was, it was great. Uh, it was just, um, I learned a lot, but it, it had its, um, it had hit its peak. So it was time to move on. Financially, it wasn't paying enough. So uh, I, I took a job in corporate and um, I worked for the National Basketball League head office uh, from 2004 to 2008. And I was a marketing and communication executive. And this was really good for me because, you know, I'd only been in basketball on one side on the floor, but I was mentored by a great uh, marketing mind, Rick Burton. Um, he is, he's a, a professor at Syracuse University now. He heads up the sports department there. Uh, I was able to learn the business of basketball, the politics. You know, I, I learned how to communicate with stakeholders, all the teams. Um, you know, I dined with CEOs and GMs. I, I got to learn how to act around these people, uh, get a feel for what it takes. You know, understanding contracts. You know, I, I was dealing with sponsorships, so I had to learn. You know, all about you know, just checking on details and, and making sure provisions were provided. You know, just everything like that. I had to. You know, it was really important. And then you know how to deal with the power players. You know, egos. There's a lot of people in high positions that you know they just yeah. They, they're hard to work with, but you just kind of figure it out. So uh, in 2007, we get, a, we get a media partner, a new media partner, Getty's Images. And um, so I'm messing around with the, uh, the website. And RC son, Chase, is a freshman at Kansas. So I, um, I was like, you know what, I'll just look him up. And then I found a couple of images. But as you can see, there's a watermark on there. Uh, so that if you try to print it, it's going to have a big Getty's Images watermark on there. 
So I checked out the price to purchase. I mean, it's $4.99 for the image. But luckily, I had free access through our partnership. So I, I sent RC about four pictures of Chase. And he got back to me almost immediately. And he was so thankful and grateful uh, for me to send them. And he even uh, sent an email to his entire family and CC'd me in and just it was cool. Like I, I didn't expect that. That wasn't that wasn't the goal, but I just I just wanted to share that because I know he loves his son and it was pretty cool and they were really good images. And then he said, you know, what am I doing? Um, and I said, what? Well, I assume you mean in life. He goes, yeah. And he said, I said, look, you know, I'm kind of at a crossroads. He said, next year, why don't you just come over and hang out? I'm like, what? And he was like, yeah, come over for you know, uh, we have the final four in San Antonio. It's that's in 2008. Um, you know, then we can go to the uh, PIT, which is the uh, draft invitational in Portsmouth, and then the, the draft combine in Orlando, and then stay for the draft. I'm like, wow, I, you know, I did the math. That's three months. That's pretty cool. Uh, I said, but you know what? I want to get my hands dirty. I just don't want to sit around. And, um, you know, he said, okay, cool. We'll figure something out. So I had it in my head, like, I'm okay, I'm going over and I'm really going to make the most of this. So, uh, in 2007, there were two NBA prospects. Uh, Nathan Jawai was uh, drafted in the second round in 2008. Uh, and then Joe Ingles, who plays for us, he went out and drafted. As you can see, Joe has a lot more hair. Uh, so I should probably send this picture to him. Uh, and then the Spurs decided to send out Rob Hennigan, who's their director of basketball operations. And he wanted to... Um, he asked me to help him with the logistics. And, and so I basically planned out his whole trip. You know, I, I wanted to make a good impression and show him like I can, I can uh, help him and, and I'm organized. So I um, basically after that, he's like, okay, by the way, you know, RC said, take care of your plane. He's going to take care of your plane ticket. Uh, come over in March. So I uh, flew over there and this is where I got to meet a, a bunch of people, Dennis Lindsay, um, it was the assistant GM, uh, got to work, not directly, but obviously Paul, Greg Popovich, who's the uh, head coach and president, um, Quinn Snyder, who's now the current head coach of the Utah Jazz, was the head coach of the then D-League Austin Toros. Uh, Taylor Jenkins was a basketball operations intern with me. And just a quick story about Taylor. You know, he, the first day I met him, he gave me a ride home. And I said, hey, you know, what do you want to do long term? He said, I want to coach. I was like, really? He goes, and he told me a story. He, he played high school basketball. He went to Penn, really intelligent, but he never played college basketball. He never helped a college basketball team in any capacity. Never had any coaching experience. And now he's a head coach of the Memphis Grizzlies. So just shows a lot of hard work can get you somewhere. Um, you know, this, so, and this is Zach Guthrie. He was an Austin Torres intern. And I'll talk a little bit more about him later. Um, and again, as it goes back to my theory of uh, be, you know, respectful to everyone high and also below. And, um, and then finally, uh, Nixon Dovelian, who was the equipment manager, who's a real good friend of mine st to this day. Um, and uh, there's also a link later on. So anyway, um, as we move forward, uh, I did really well, I, I guess good enough to make an impression on RC that he brought me back for another year with the Spurs. And this is just, to give you a detail of what I did uh, in my role as an intern. So I was in charge of building, building the, uh, the draft prospect and free agent DVD library. Back then, yes, DVD was the thing. Now it's everything is just streaming. Um, scattered a number of games, which is great. Got out and uh, they were really good about uh, me going to different events, getting some experience. Uh, I was involved in a lot of meetings. So basically anything, anytime there was a meeting, I was in there. And of course I wasn't a, a voice in the meeting, but uh, I was able to be around it and ex experience it and learn. Um, you know, I, I got to talk to our scouts on a regular basis and help me grow. I'd, I'd always ask questions and they were really good with helping to give advice and answer anything I had, uh, I wanted to know about. Um, logistically, I had to uh, coordinate a lot of travel and, and things like that for workouts, um, open gym, mini camps. Uh, it was good, I, I liked the organization of it. 
and then uh, assisted just in basic day-to-day -day operations. Uh, so they really, they really give you a lot of responsibilities. Uh, the Spurs have a great um, internship program. It's, it's, the name has changed now, but they, they take on people every few years. I know the numbers are crazy in terms of applications. You know, maybe I think it's a thousand a year. So, but if you can get in there, it, it's good. It, you know, it's real beneficial and it can really help you. And the last thing, I just I ran a lot of errands uh, for front office and coaches. You know, I'd you know drive around, pick up someone's son, take him home from practice. Uh, I used to I used to you know go to RCs and 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 dog dog sit and house sit for him. Uh, you know, just stuff like that. You do whatever you need to do. Um, so moving forward, this is a this is the Spurs mantra. It's uh it's all over their practice facility and their locker room. Um, so it's, I go look at a stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, it was split in two. And I know it was, it was not that blow that did it, but all that had gone before. Basically, you're not going to get to where you are on the first try or maybe the second try. It, it may take a hundred. 101 attempts, but you know, know that everything you're doing before you get there is all part of the journey. And that's all, you know, it just shows, you know, if you're resilient, you're patient, and, uh, you know, you care, you can find a way. And I think, you know, I, I think it's a great saying. I think it's being publicized out there. And, um, you know, San Antonio will frame that sign and they'll give it to a lot of their guests that come through. So um, anyway, uh, so, so my time at the Spurs was great. The internship, uh, unfortunately, there wasn't another job, like a full-time job after that. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate that UTSA, which is University of Texas San Antonio, they had an opening uh, with the um, staff there. And I was uh, able to get the, bas the director of basketball operations role. And I served in that capacity uh, from 2009 to 2015, uh, I was able to get a promotion uh, for a year from uh, 2015 to 16, and was made an assistant coach, was which was great. Uh, unfortunately, we were let go after uh, 2016, but um, you know it's the business, and um, you know we were fortunate enough. In 2011, we won the conference tournament, and um, so we were uh, we got to the second round of the NCAA tournament. I, um, it was a great experience. If, if you get there, I, I, you know, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's, it's nothing like it. Uh, made some great friendships in college and you know, built some great relationships. Um, so we got fired. Uh, it was hard. You know, I, um, I was out of work for about six months, but you know, it's, uh, I was very fortunate that, um, oh, uh, that you know, we a lot of people were very kind and, and gave a lot of time to me. But um, so what I'll do is I'm going to skip back to 2012 and just go very uh, kind of like an experience I had. This is Rich Cho with the Charlotte, then Bobcats. He was uh, the general manager there. And one one night I just I had an epiphany. I, I was like, you know what, I want to get back to the NBA, and uh, I sent him an email. And I uh, just told him my story and, you know, I'd love to maybe try and get involved. Uh, he replied at three in the morning and then he said, hey, uh, give me a call and, uh, you know, let's talk. So then I uh, basically, you know, I said, hey, look, I was impressed with your resume, but you know what? You had a spelling error and I was I was really tempted to throw away your email. So I said, you know, what was it? And he says, well, you had your verse and it should have been your oh my gosh seriously but you know what he had a good point ever since i've been really detailed in everything i do uh but he said look i'll give you a chance you can submit some reports to me and uh you know it's um you know we don't have anything full time but you know you're welcome to do that and if you can also submit some uh scouting you know not just scouting but intel that'd be really good um i said okay so i think i did a good enough job where you know, he, he was wanting to meet me uh, halfway through the year, but it just, we couldn't figure it out. So, um, 
season ended and then I, I, I knew he was going to be at some league and I really wanted to meet him. So I said, Hey, Rich, you know, I'd love to, you know, get with you. Uh, can we, um, can we meet? Can I buy you dinner? And he was like, sure, but tell me what the restaurant is. Cause I want to look it up. I'm like, who asks? like, who gets invited and asks like if they can check the restaurant? I mean, I'm, I'm paying. So anyway, um, I, I found this place. I know he, I, I did my research. He loves sushi. It was a place called Kabuto. Um, and you know, it's, so it's kind of pricey, $120 per person for the, and I hope I don't butcher this, Amakase course. And you know, so it was really good, but it was so good that he wanted to try some other sushi on the menu. And I was like, gosh, okay. So, you know, let's do this. Um, and you know, so we had really good conversation. I was um, able to uh, ask him if I could hand him a proposal for a scouting uh, job. He said, yeah, sure, no problem. You know, great conversation. At the end of the night, you know, I got the final bill and um, came out to 327. And I was like, oh crap. I mean, this is, if there was an emoji, this is, this is how I would describe it. And um, basically uh, I had enough money to make it work, but uh, it was tight. Uh, but he really appreciated that. I think he went back to the restaurant a few nights later. So um, mo moving forward, uh, again, I, I re, um, basically I, I gave him another year. Uh, Australia had a, a kid named Dante Exum who was a draft prospect. I was uh, able to do some reports in him. You know, Rich wasn't picking high in the draft, but uh, Rob Hennigan, who had come out to Australia many years ago and we'd forged a relationship, they ha had a high draft pick. He offered to buy the Intel from me, which was great. Um, so, uh, you know, I felt good about that. I felt like my work was uh, developing and, and there was getting some traction there. Um, so after the season, I, there was an opening with Charlotte. I, I called Rich, I said, hey, can I, can I get involved with it? He said, sure, just set up an interview. Uh, so I was really prepared. And then I'm going to give you a, so I set up a war room. And this was it. And this, so you'll see, we will do it. We're going to do a Skype interview. And on the, what they can't see is all my notes. So I had these big poster boards. I put up stuff about me, uh, you know, I guess like a SWOT analysis of, of what I could and couldn't do. Uh, I had the salary cap on there, uh, just little different stats. I had Charlotte plays, which I had no idea what they were, but anyway, I just put it on there. Um, you know, it just, if you're religious, great. If not, you know, make sure you pray to the hoop gods because they're real. Uh, so anyway, this is just another look without the computer in the way. So it's, I think it helped because I didn't know I had it there. Um, but you know, it's, uh, definitely a, um, you know, I, I found it advantageous. So anyway, the interview went well. Uh, it was, um, unfortunately, I, I got a call a couple weeks later. They said, look, you did great. You, you made a good impression, but um, Michael's bringing in Jasmine, his daughter, as in Michael Jordan. And like, you can't just, what do you do? Like, <laughs> it's uh, the goat right there. I'm like, okay, you know, I was kind of mad, but you know what, it is what it is. Uh, a year later, I got promoted to uh, assistant coach at UTSA. And, um, you know, I, I, again, you know, it was a great experience doing that. Got to see Meadow Carter on, the, on my first AU visit, uh, recruiting uh, tournament. And uh, he was so helpful to me. And uh, so, um, you know, that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was good. And so moving forward, uh, after we, you know, and then we got, so we got fired in two, 2016. Um, I was trying to get back in, uh, had a, co a conversation with the NBA about working in China with one of their academies. Really wasn't, you know, at the time I was like, you know, I'll take it, but uh, I wasn't sure. And then they said, well, look, we'll get back to you. It was a Friday, we'll get back to you on the Monday. And um, so Monday came and went, but then I got a call um, on, uh, on Monday night and uh, I'll skip over Nixon. But uh, Zach Guthrie, who was an intern with Austin back in the day, he was now an assistant coach with uh, Utah Jazz. And he said, hey, look, one of our guys left. Can you, can you do advanced scout? And I, I swore up and down, like I'd never do that role because it's the grind, uh, it's hard, and you, know, you need to really um, learn a lot real quick. And I said, yeah, look, I'll do it. 
I said, I haven't done it in the NBA level, but I'll do it. And I, I said, Zach, you know, I appreciate it. He said, he said, dude, when I was a scrub back with Austin, you were the, one of the few guys that would take their time to talk to me. And I appreciate that. And I never forgot it. And I thought, you know, that's kind of cool, you know. Uh, so, and then we had Mike Wells, who was on staff, who was also at San Antonio. He, he really vouched for me hard. And then, uh, you know, Quinn was like, okay, well, yeah, if he's interested, let's bring him in. And then finally, Dennis Lindsay, who is now the general manager of, of Utah, he, uh, he put in a, a good word for me. So, you know, I got an NBA job without really having an interview, which is kind of weird, but hey, I'll take it. So, um, all right, enough about me. Let's talk about scouting, okay? Um, I'm going to break it down, all right? So what are the different types of scouting? Preparation and planning, travel, methodology on game day, the challenges of the role, and then, so different types of scouting. You have the college scouting, which is the draft, okay? Kids that are eligible for the draft. You have international scouting, which you have draft eligible guys, and then you can also have uh, international guys uh, that are available in free agency. Uh, there's minor league scouting, which is the G League. There's advanced scouting. And then there's pro personnel scouting, which is what I do. Um, I'm going to touch on advanced scouting real quick since I did that for two years, and it might be interest, interesting for you coaches out there. So that's Steve Kerr. Uh, he's got his hands out. Um, and so the objective is to get live play calls and match them up to the film. So you see Steve there. and you can't hear this, but he, he just said, what the fuck? He's got his arms out. So the general fan, you know, they're probably wondering, oh, he's probably just mad at his team. It's actually a play call. Puts his arms out and he says, what the fuck? And then, um, you know, Golden State went run their action. Um, so uh, no secret, it was exposed on some article a couple, of weeks, maybe a year ago. Uh, some scouts are required to diagram all the plays and label them. So they get in fast draw and then they, they match up the plays and then they, with the, uh, the name of the play, uh, the team's upcoming opponent schedule dictates where you are traveling to next. Okay. Um, after the game, we download the film and confirm the play calls, uh, call sheets, you know, need usually need to be turned in to the coaching staff by the next morning. Um, if it's the playoffs, I, I submit them. I used to submit it every quarter. Um, some scouts travel up to 28 days a month. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example of a bad road trip I had. I started out in San Antonio, hit Charlotte. So that's uh, 1,095 miles. I went up to Indiana, head to um, 427 miles, and we had a blizzard. And then the next morning, I had to jump on a plane at 6 a.m. and head out to Los Angeles for a noon game. And uh, so that's 18, you know, um, so 1,800 miles. The next day after the LA game, I had to fly to New York. That's another uh, 2,475 miles. I had a day off, but then I had the game. And then finally flew back to San Antonio. It's another 1,500 miles. So, um, you know, miles flown, 7,397. And then time zone changes. Five. So my body was killing me and asking me, you know, why are you doing this? I mean, but you know, it is part of the business. It's a grind, and I know some guys that have it worse than me. So um, you know, I appreciated uh, the job doing that. But I, I, I the long-term goal was to uh, get into uh, pro scouting. Here's an example of a call sheet. Um, basically, I won't go through everything, but it has a time slots, and then when the play is called. Uh, in the uh, inverted um, parenthesis is uh, what the action looks like. So they'll touch it, say 11, 18 in the first quarter, chin pass. So it'll be Van Gundy touching his chin and, and doing a passing motion. Um, so that's a basic example. Uh, and then uh, in uh, any inverted commas, it'll be what they actually said. So um, 8, 8.58 in the first quarter. A AFT is out to free throw. Van Gunn is yelling out snap and he's snapping his fingers at the same time. So um, that's just an example uh, of, of how a play call sheet looks when I was with the Jazz. Um, so I did that for two years. And then I, these, 
I basically said to Freddie, our uh, director of pro personnel, look, I want to get into pro personnel scouting. So what can I do? And he gave me some advice. And then Justin Zanuck, our assistant GM, he also was really, um, really good in supporting me and, and told me some things that I could do on the side. And then Bart Taylor, who's, uh, who's my boss, the director of scouting, he was really, um, really positive and, and trying to help me. And then at the end, you know, at the end of the 2018 season, uh, actually later that summer, they, they offered me a, um, a job as a pro scout, which is, you know, what I wanted and had been hoping to do all along. So um, what is pro personal scouting? The priority is to identify and evaluate current NBA players potentially to trade for or sign a free agency. Okay. Uh, we have target lists, uh, short-term targets, which are upcoming free agents, and then long-term guys that maybe we want to trade for. Uh, what is you know, what is it playing positional fit with us? Uh, that's a question we ask. You know, are they a character fit? Are they good, you know, are they good people? Uh, how do we view their current value and playing level? And then, you know, how do we project their future value and playing level? So maybe right now they're not playing at a high level, but three years from now they could develop. Uh, you know, we need to understand the player's salary and contract situation because we have a salary cap. Um, and this is a quote from Bobby Axelrod. Everyone has access to the information. We just know how to analyze it better. So that's, that's what we try to do. Analyze what we have, the information. Um, this is something that's uh, Quint, Quint Snyder. You know, he, he, this is what he, he finds important to him in terms of players. They need to have toughness and grit. Uh, they need to be passionate, have a love of the game, and work. Um, they need to be, you know, there needs to be unselfishness, communicative ability on and off the court. So not just to be able to talk, but to listen. Uh, competitiveness, leadership capability, intelligence. Um, you know, does he have jazz DNA? This is something in the front office, you know, we, we look at. I've broken it down so you can read it a little better. Toughness, alertness, character, smart, play to win reliability, competitiveness. Is he a hard worker? Does he love basketball? Do they have stability, maturity, selflessness? Uh, are they an unselfish teammate? Um, what am I looking for uh, in a player? Uh, you know, we're not just looking for good players. We wanna help, we wanna find players that help us win. So the tangibles, the quickness and athleticism, uh, size and length, elite skills for position, ability to defend multiple positions, strength and physicality, fundamentals, and footwork. And footwork is something that's really started to um, get my attention because, you know, if, if James Harden can basically step away 50 times into a, an open space for a jump shot, like he's obviously got really good footwork and it's in his gather. I mean, he does it. And it's legal. Uh, he just disguises it so well. Uh, so that's something that we really, you know, I, I'm very interested in. Uh, basketball IQ, feel, instincts, uh, decision making, you know, receptive to learning, listening ability. That's so key with Quinn because he's not going to repeat himself a couple times. You know, he's going to say it, and you might be able to screw up once, but um, he's not going to. He might say it, he might help you one more time, but that's it. Uh, attention span, you know. Uh, if, a, if a practice is long, you can't be daydreaming out there because if you screw it up, like that's on you. Um, ability to process instructions is important. Ability to execute. And then intangibles, the motor, toughness and res resilience. Competitive nature, do they have a kill killer mentality? Um, you know, they're, pa they're uh, excuse me, fight back you know, and passion and drive. You know, are they a winner? Are they a leader? Do they have the desire? Can they be great in their role? Can they be a great teammate? Can they be selfless? You know, do they have the buy-in? Are they coachable? And uh, the body language is key. Um, what is a player's NBA skill? I'll go through this real quick. Um, basic, I'll read them off. A player that can both generate offense for others and himself. The majority of the time this player is looking to pass or create for others, even if they are not a great scorer themselves. Uh, 
So even if they are a great scorer themselves. So Mike Conley and Joe Ingles, uh, two guys that know how to pass it and play in pick and roll. Uh, definition of a scorer, a player who looks to create scoring opportunities for himself first. He may have some ability to pass or not. Regardless, his first inclination when he receives the ball is to attempt to score. And so Donovan Mitchell and, and Boyan Bogdanovich uh, fall in that category. Shooter, a player with superior confidence who can take and make shots. Shot quickness and accuracy are both important factors. It is important to note the different types of shooters. Catch and shoot, off the dribble, on the move. And again, uh, Boyan uh, Bogdanovich is one of those guys. A finisher, a player who is high volume and high percentage finisher at or around the rim. They may be a dunker like Rudy, uh, but they may be a predominantly below the rim player with great touch as well. And that's uh, a good example is, is Donovan Mitchell. Uh, rebounder, a great pursuer of the ball with great instincts and anticipation for missed shots. Has the ability to finish the play with a catch and good ball security. Uh, he is a player who consistently wins the leverage battle on body-to-body -body contact. Has good hands to, to time the catch. And that's, uh, you know, Rudy Gobert is our leading uh, rebounder. Uh, and defender, a player who can guard their own position in an on-ball and or help situation. A player has the ability to defend multiple uh, positions and switch when needed. He fights and com competes with a high level of resiliency in order not to be scored on. Uh, bigs provide uh, rim protection like Rudy and a perimeter defender will contain the man or disrupt the offensive team, uh, team's flow or direction. So that's uh, Joe Ingles. Okay. Uh, play and tell is something that I call the cryptocurrency of the NBA because it's really gain, uh, gained a lot of value over the, uh, the last few years. Uh, it's not just can a guy play. Now it's finding, about, finding out about things like their personnel, a personal background and their family, uh, you know, personally, personality traits, what are they like, uh, off the court, you know, are they good citizens, do they take care of themselves, um, workplace approach and attitude, are they coachable, and their basketball ability is pretty important, and then health and medical, you know, you want to make sure uh, that you're bringing in somebody that, you know, is healthy or hasn't had any major um, medical setbacks. So sources of intel, I'm going to, I'm going to go through these real quick. Uh, and we don't, it doesn't mean that it's on this list that we've hit on everybody, but uh, NBA coaching staffs, uh, NBA front office, boy, ball boys and girls, locker room attendants, AAU coaches, personal trainers, team security, media members, they're, all, they're always around the players, uh, teammates, current or former, uh, family members and friends, uh, support staff, athletic trainers, players, former agent. Usually the current agent is unlikely to give you anything of worth because they're just going to be trying to sell you. Uh, international and minor league staff, uh, college coaches, support staff, high school coaches, teachers, landlords, realtor. Um, you know, I heard a story where a player t completely trashed a rental property. And so, you know, you want to make sure you're not bringing in those kind of guys. Uh, former business associates, national team coaches and staff, hotel, front desk, valets, housekeeping, security. You want to, you know, maybe they know something about how they, you know, take care of things when they're, when they're you know, in a hotel room. Um, restaurant, stra uh, restaurant staff, bartenders, hairstylists, barber, tattoo artists, uh, former members of inner circles and entourages, nightclub security, servers. You know, is he a good tipper? I mean, you know, that's important. And other known associates. Um, okay, preparation and planning, uh, travel. So I'm on the road about 20, 22 days a month during the season. Uh, so when selecting games to scout, you know, factors to consider are how many games can I see in one region? Maybe on the East Coast, I can go to New York and see the, the Knicks and Nets. Philly's not far away. DC is, you know, I can get the train down there or, or head north to Boston. Uh, or I could go to LA and spend five days there, see four games. Uh, you know, can I find time to meet up with other NBA personnel or friends and just get dinner or lunch or drinks? Uh, the game I'm interested in attending, you know, how many prospects are there on the short term list? Um, you know, flights book early, have a contingency, a contingency plan if a target becomes 
a priority and you know mother nature she's she's ruthless you know she can really mess with your plans so just be prepared um you know hotels i try to you know do my homework uh know the geography of the city understand the traffic flow to the arena uh, if i'm in la i don't stay downtown but um you know i'm i'm leaving my hotel at three to get there for a seven o'clock tip um pick a hotel in a safe area too uh and then you know Usually I rent a car, but you know, in New York and you know DC, I'll get an Uber and Lyft just because I, I don't want to drive there. Um, game day mentality, you know, just be rested and alert. Uh, yes, I caffeinate now. I never used to until I had to do advanced scouting. You know, I'll take a double shot, you know, of espresso now. Um, you know, be be receptive to learning something new each game. You know, networking is key. You know, make friends, not foes. Just because a scout is on another team doesn't mean you can't. You know, be friends with them and network. Um, be a professional, not a fan. I've seen a, a one team had an advanced scout grab a beer before the game, and he's trying to take notes. I'm like, what are you doing? Some other guy brought a, a DSLR, like a, a really big, uh, like professional lens to a game, and he was doing advanced for one team, and he's taking pictures of the cheer girls. Like, come on, dude. Like, you know, come on. It's your job. You know, trust your instincts, um, and uh, you know, just you know. Trust your gut when you when you're looking at players. Uh, methodology on game day. So I, if I'll try and arrive either in the city the day before evening, maybe I can grab dinner with somebody, or at least by 1 p.m. on the day of the game. You know, check into the hotel. I arrive at the arena two hours before tip off and pick up my credential. You know, I'll find out where my seat out you know seat location is and see what other scouts will be there. Uh, I'll go out to the court and watch pregame workouts. Um, and that's where you can get to see a lot of players that don't usually play working out. Sometimes they go on two on two. Uh, you can see work habits. You can see the relationships between the coaches and the players. It's, it's really important just kind of building a picture, painting a picture on these guys. And I'll talk to other scouts and uh, coaches and executives. I'll go to media dining uh, about 35 minutes before because that's the time when players go in the locker room. And then I'll go to the seat around 10 minutes before. Uh, so in game, my methodology is is know my target list. You know, I, I don't want to go sit down like, oh crap, who am I scouting today? You know, have it ready before the game. You know, what am I looking for? Know your personnel. Um, you know, if player X, you know, is is a point guard that likes to run pick and roll, you know, make sure I'm looking for that. Um, you know, make make notes during the dead ball situations. It's hard to make notes when when play is in action because you're gonna miss something. Now I do occasionally if I see something because I'm, I'm worried I'm going to forget. But dead balls are usually the best time. Uh, challenges at the game, you know the noise, the crowds, the angles, location of the seat. Uh, post game, you know maybe I'll meet with some coaches and scouts and grab a drink or a meal. Uh, finalizing finalizing the game report, I'll watch specific clips on synergy to fill in any blanks. You know off the ball defense, screening, rebounding stuff you're not going to be actually looking for all the time uh, in a live game. Uh, I'll summarize my notes in an easy read format. Uh, I'll submit the report into the scouting database and at 6 p.m. Uh, all, all the reports are sent out to every level at GM, scouts, uh, everyone else on the emails. So this is a, um, okay, this is a finalized scouting report and uh, I'll briefly just go through it real quickly. Uh, so, uh, st started at the three, uh, NOP, which is for New Orleans, uh, looked to be sharing the ball a lot early and his touches were sporadic. On the catch, he looked to face up and explode all, all options. In the ISOs, he looks to jab step and shot fake you early and utilizes a large step to get around the defense. His jump shot from all areas looks smooth and confident both on the catch and off a few bounces. In pick and roll, he wasn't rushed and made solid reads. He was able to use the dribble to create separation and get clean looks. He sells the hesitation crossover well and on one possession exploded for a dunk. Uh, Middleton seemed to give him problems with his length on the perimeter. Defensively on the ball, he's quick enough to stay in front, but has issues when he has to absorb contact from the offensive player. He's very light and offers minimal physical resistance. To his credit, he has quick hands combined with super long arms. It allows him to swipe at the ball effectively. In transition, he tends to avoid contact as he opened up his hits, hips frequently to whoever was attacking the rim. He quit on a couple of plays off the ball and didn't always fight around picks and screens. On the glass, he is so long he finds the ball despite not being a fan of physicality in the paint. And then I kind of sum it up real quick. 
because it is just a game report. It's not like the overall report. You know, he is high, he's a high-level scoring forward that can play make. He needs to improve defensively. He needs to continue to gain strength. He would be a fit if made available and willing to join us. So, um, continuous learning. Um, you know, once a month, I actually try to meet uh, with a former FBI agent, and we discuss advances in research and identification. And he's got a lot of good things to say, and I, you know, I just try to take as much as I can from him. Uh, you know, con you know, trying to connect with other scouts in other industries to compare methods. Uh, I think crossing over is always good. Exchange information. Um, I'll connect with different basketball journalists to pick their pick their brain on on, on investigative reporting and building relationships. Uh, they, these journalists you know, tend to um, you know build relationships with the players, and you know I, I want to know as much as I can, and and maybe that helps me down the road. Um, this this during the hiatus, I've watched a, a bunch of select uh, TV series that try to help me formulate ideas on competitive advantage. Um, so. Billions is a great series. Um, you know, Bobby Axelrod is a great GM, if he was, uh, in basketball. Uh, Walter White from Breaking Bad, a little violent, but well-written. Um, and then Ozark, and that's, you know, that's Ruth Langmore. You know, everyone, everyone knows that Marty Bird is kind of like the star of the show, but Ruth is really the boss. And then we got uh, Better Call Saul. I think that's really well-written. Uh, and... It's Frank Underwood from House of Cards. You know, if you if you don't mind politics, that's a pretty good one too. So just finishing up, challenges of the role, travel. You know, this is what I see a lot of. Um, not a bad view, but that's that's where I spend a lot of my time in the air. Um, it can be grueling on the body and on the you know on your family and everything like that. But you know, it's uh, very fortunate to have the job that I have. Um, and with Southwest, I have a companion pass and, you know, you get all the status levels. It's pretty good. Um, impact on family is hard. You know, I try to travel just Monday through Friday and then and be home for the weekends, spend it with, uh, you know, my family. Um, so one scouting trip, I was actually going to take them with me to Houston. Um, that's my daughter, Alexis, with uh, John Yim, who's an assistant with the Blazers, who was on this uh, Zoom a few weeks ago. And... Um, so my wife had an emergency, uh, she couldn't make it, and we, we couldn't find a babysitter. So she's like, can you just take the kid? I'm like, sure. Like, hey, you know, this will be like Trouble with the Curve, that movie with Clint Eastwood where his daughter, he's a baseball scout and he takes his daughter everywhere. And no, uh, she was a pain in the ass. I love her, but oh, never again. Anyway, um, eating habits. Yeah, that is, uh, you see that a lot, you know, on the West Coast because, you're limited with time, you know, in and out, you know, uh, I don't mind it. Uh, I prefer Whataburger, but anyway, you know, that's up for debate. Um, but yeah, you know, sometimes that's all you can get. I try to eat healthy, but you know, that's sometimes that's the best you can do. Uh, life balance is really important in health. Uh, you know, I try to, uh, stay near a beach. If I'm on the coast somewhere, try to run, uh, daily and you know, it's, you need that. You need that mentally and physically, spiritually as well. Um, and staying relevant and, uh, you know, longevity. Uh, try, for me to try and stay in this, in this business, you know, who knows? Tomorrow, you never know what's going to happen. Um, but this is, so the Spurs have this annual alumni, um, intern alumni uh, dinner in Vegas every year. It didn't happen this year, of course, because of the, uh, uh, situation but uh you know i attend it every year try to meet new people every year there's actually a lot more people um from that group that didn't attend this um this party but uh, a lot of gms and, and head coaches uh it, it's good i i try to stay in touch with, with as many as i can but you just never know but, uh matt who's moderating it was there mike obviously um with half the other people in the audience coming from the Columbia University coaching staff, allyship, allyship or whatever, you know, it's very important. Um, but then it was, yeah, Shenton and myself. Um, and, you know, just, again, you know, if you want to talk about two different styles, I, there's a famous story when I was at the Math the Catholic, um, Alan Stein, who at the time was one of the most uh, renowned high school uh, strength and conditioning coach in the country. He had came over from Montrose Christian, where Stu Vetter coached. 
and he came over to the math at Catholic. And Alan was saying something along the lines of, you know, you can have two very successful programs, but two very different approaches. You know, where Coach Stu Vetter, who, who had KD come through the program, Gravis Vasquez, Justin Anderson, you know, they were this like by the book, bullet point, all of that style. And, uh, and Mike Jones, uh, my boss for three years at DeMatha Catholic, just, you know, with all the history, you know, coming before him with Morgan Wooten, uh, Alan was shocked. He's like, we were so loosey goosey. Like, it's not like the reputation you would have expected from DeMatha. Um, but all that to say, I don't have a 40 page uh, bullet point. And I, and I've been in contact with Shenton and Mike and, and, uh, and Matt during the week. So I, you know, just again, uh, for me, I coach by feel. So just again, I know it's been a long time, so I want to keep it short for, for you guys. But I want I want to give you a couple things that hopefully you guys will think about and walk away from. And and really, um, you know, again, Shenton's not he's not on the screen, but you know, my email box is open because I answer every email. My voice, you know, my voicemail. I uh, I li I re respond to every voicemail. I learned that from watching Alan Stein. So uh, yeah, I'm you know I. For us, you know, I have another call at five, but I want to make sure, there it is, uh, that I give you guys some things to think about and any follow-up question, I want to make myself available to you guys. Um, so again, going back to 2012, you know, you got uh, Shenton with the, the professional um, Zoom background with the Utah Jazz. He and I actually crossed paths because I was the director of basketball operations at the University of Portland. He was at UTSA. And again, this is a great time to reflect as his journey went one way with the NBA uh, what, where you guys are finding me now is, you know, again, I'm, I'm having to make my own brand. I don't have, you know, anything like that, but this is my high school basketball program office. You know, you got leftover boxes of chips from, you know, our youth league uh, tournament that we were having in March. That's still here post COVID time. Uh, my fridge is still stocked. Uh, um, and this is it. This is my space and this is my life. So, um, so, so just real quick, what's in the name? Uh, Lake Cho. Um, my last name again is Cho. My Korean name is Chol Chung Ho. So just even in that, I don't know if there's any Korean Americans in here, but the fact that, you know, when you come to this country, you know, they give you a name, right? But in the Korean culture, really my last name, you know, we're saying we're being authentic, you know, it's spelled J-O. Um, and so, you know, just even as recently as, you know, a few years back when I was at University of Portland, I was the, I was one of the assignments that I had was Nike is just in our backyard. And they have a product testing team that always comes in and they put the shoes on our players um, as an ops guy. That's a way to save budget. So I'm all about it. And these creatives from Nike, uh, I befriended them. And before one of the meetings, they were coming and they sent me a text. And here's a list. And again, this is where I came in 86. Uh, the nicknames I grew up with were Marshmallow, not very clever, Marsupial for the Aussies in there. They, somebody thought Marshall Marsupial, that was funny. Uh, and it ranged from that to like Cho Cho Train, which is kind of funny. Uh, and then again, you know, I, I, the reason I picked this title for you guys today is, you know, you want to talk about my microaggressions are there. So, you know, for me, it's Marshall Chow Main, right? So those are things, again, just keeping it 100, you know, as an Asian American growing up in this country, um, we go through it. And, you know, even as a professional, you know, coming into the, the career late, um, I'm close to 30 38 years old when I'm at University of Portland and these good friends of mine are sending me these texts and they go in order Barack Chobama Shaquille Choneal Chopra Winfrey and on and on and on and again basically the joke is that if you take my last name and put it anywhere where letter O goes in you know it actually Having lived through all my life with that lane, it was the first time where these creatives from Nike kind of, you know, even opened my horizons even more to that. But the nickname that stuck to me with during those two years the most, um, I worked for an honorable man. I worked for a guy, Eric Revena, who's now an assistant coach at Georgia Tech. Um, really, you know, lighting the world on, world on fire with, you know, his initiative to get people registered, the young student athletes in this country registered to vote. But again, having earned my way into a division one coaching staff. Um, one of the nicknames he gave, you know, the nickname that I, that stuck with me for the two years was Chobo. Again, the D Dobo being director of basketball operations. And so that's one of those things, you know, you, at the time you roll with, it's funny. And I look back on that time and I wonder to myself why it is that I didn't speak up. And 
There you go. Right on cue. The high school, high school office cut off my light. So here we go. We're on the move, guys. This is this is the ultimate test in my flexibility. Here we go. The lights are out. On that note, the basketball god said, "Uh, no more on that one." Uh, so I'm on the move. Um, and so this is something I want to share with you guys. Is I've gotten to a point where now I can authentically own who I am and what my identity is in speaking up, especially during this time. And I'm embracing the fact that I am Lake Cho. Um, I currently coach at Lake Oswego High School or claim to fame is that Kevin Love attended school here, obviously. Um, and this is my fifth year. And the nickname for this place, among many other things, just even yesterday, we had, a, we had an incident where uh, a young Indian American student in our middle school, moved by the movement that we're going through right now, wanted to paint a Black Lives Matter a sign in her window. She was proud to share it, stand alongside with, you know, everybody who's marching in the city 60 days on. And they received an anonymous, anonymous letter from somebody that basically said, hey, would you kindly take down the sign because it's bringing down our property value. Uh, there's a history here of redlining in our state, uh, Oregon, if, if any of you guys know the history here is, you know, had some of the most racist policies that reflect today in the lack of diversity that we live in the state. And out of that state, I coached the program that has the highest socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic background. Um, Lake, Lake Oswego used to be called Lake No Negro as, as a derogatory nickname. Um, I had an assistant coaches, you know, on my staff who were African American in my first few years. And there would be times when they would pull up to practice and they would be 10, 15 minutes late. And I'd be like, and Will Lou, you're on here. Um, a young man that you coach who put on uh, Damian Lillard, Dondrell Campbell, one of my, a brother of mine, you know, that I consider a brother. And he's showing up to our practice late. Why? Because he got pulled over. And that's as recently as five years ago. So here I am, this face, a Korean American immigrant during this time. And I am the head basketball coach at Lake O. And so that's the thing, I guess, for me with you guys. Um, you know, I had, I had a couple things that I was talking to, again, another coach on this group, David Choi. Um, and this is what I'll send. The reason I wanted to share just the term unapologetically Lake Cho is for all of us, you know, and again, I'm, in, I'm, I'm inspired by, uh, if I take a, away one thing from Shenton's 50 page slide, uh, it's, hey man, it's okay to have a FU list. Like, cause whether you guys will admit it or not, I think we ball in this space. If you look like this and you're trying to exist in the basketball space, experience one thing or another. That, that is a microaggression and in some in some cases outright racism and so for for us to be in the space this many times and I know that it's been a few weeks now and we're all comfortable and we're starting to get to know each other where you guys are building this community I, I think really what's the next step you know and that's that's what I was you know sharing with Mike that I wanted to just come here and just speak from the heart because this group is really special to see what what it's become in the last eight years you know and I think to where my career has gone since then. And I get excited, just all these people just hyped about, you know, asking Shenton all these questions, asking all the previous week's speakers questions and thinking to myself, how much faster can we get there as a group? Um, and so it's, you know, it's uh, unapologetically late show because uh, I just recently heard a podcast and what I'll do is, I don't have a slide, but I'm gonna just go ahead and send you guys a link in the chat um, so that you guys can just kind of bookmark it, save it. Um, see how I do this chat. Okay, so it's the group, general group, right? How do I do this, everybody? <sighs> Looks like some, the last chat I had was a private one, so it's stuck on that one. Let me just see how I, everyone, there we go. So Dumbfounded is a Korean American rapper, grew up in Cape Town, and he, he's, a, he's a rapper who I recently saw a, a, a YouTube even of him performing. He's a battle rapper. And what he says is, you know, as a Korean American rapper living in hip hop, you know, he learned how to be unapologetically Asian because hip hop is so unapologetically black. And so again, for us, you know, we live in the black and white world. So what does it mean to be unapologetically Asian? What does it mean to be unapologetically Steve Yang or, you know, Will Lu or, 
you know, Devin, Bo, all of you guys, what does it mean for you? And how do you get to a point where you can say with confidence, hey, I'm Lake Cho. Like, Lake No Negro is of the past. Not saying that we don't neglect it, but this is, a, this is one of the many faces that will represent uh, the community to the rest of the state. Um, so, you know, for us, the biggest thing, I, I built this program on, on the foundations of courage, presence, and trust. That's a whole nother topic. Just, you know, I would love to share with you guys at some point just about how, how I went about building our culture. Long story short, here's the next chat um, or next link. If you guys want to look this up and read the book, I think it's pretty powerful. Um, my first year, uh, I was at the Final Four. You know, I just finished my first year on Division One staff. I'm excited. I had just gone to this Asian coaches meeting. One of the but one of the talks I attended was by was led by John Gordon. He had a book called One Word, and it's basically an exercise that you you part, you you participate in with your team, and you come up with the one word for the team or a theme. So, for example, you know the famous story goes Jay Wright with Villanova. You know their word was attitude, right? And so the year that they won, you know that whole next play mentality, the attitude that you're going to have when things don't go well. Well, that's what they went about and did. So. All that to say, you know, my first year at University of Portland, and and I think some of you in the audience may could possibly feel this way. And and if you if you haven't, you know, had any moments of doubt where you say, hey, do I really belong here? Like I'm, you know, good for you. Congratulations, you have swagger and confidence, like that you need to make it in this world. But you know, at, at least for me at that time, I didn't have it. And it wasn't until I really went through this book, read through it, and and, and had to tell myself, hey, man, like. I'm going to take courage. Courage is going to be the word for me this year because I'm a grown ass man. I'm, I'm here. I, I was at the math before I coached in Mozambique. I started my own programs. I lived through six years being an industry school teacher in Harlem and, and, and the South Bronx. I can do this. But again, it wasn't even as a grown person, you know, grown man, I had to make that choice to do it. Um, and so the courage, courage is a big piece for us. Um, and then the year after my second year, when I was at university of Portland, uh, the word that I chose for that year was presence. So that it was a two pronged kind of definition to my heart in that, you know, I think a lot of us do this right now. Again, my lights out in the office, so my cell phone's at the desk, I'm away from it, my hands are free. My undivided attention is being given to this space, right? Um, but you, we all know in this space that we're guilty of it, right? Uh, we miss moments in our lives with our family because we have that damn thing in our hand or in our face. So, you know, that was one thing that as I proceeded in this division one world at, at the time, I didn't know that I would be leaving it at the end of that season, but I made a conscious decision going into it that I wasn't going to be that like, I wasn't going to let my family suffer because I had seen it so much in the division one world. But at the same time, the two, the double edged sword, double edged, you know, definition or whatever you want to call it for presence for me was I'm five feet, eight, 140 pounds. Again, kind of like Shenton. I didn't play. I could play a little bit, but I was a good high school player. But what would it mean if I, if I came into a space, will I, be, will I have such a presence in the words I speak, in the manner I treated people, that when I leave that space, that people would remember me? You know, how would I treat people so that when I leave that space, they would miss me? And, you know, during the toughest times, during the second year at University of Portland, you know, my mentor, Mike Jones at DeMatha, would remind me, hey, man, like, the, the impact you left in the three years here at DeMatha is, like, he would say, like, I'm almost envious. Like, I can't believe people here still talk about you, you know? And again, this isn't me bragging to you, but what it, it was a reminder for me that I was an assistant freshman coach my first year, a head freshman coach my second year. I got promoted to head JV coach my third year. At no point during my three years at DeMatha did I have that varsity assistant title or did I have put on my resume, worked, worked out Victor Oladipo, worked out Jerry and Grant, worked out Quinco. I did the work. But it's not somebody else was that shine, you know, getting that that press and the and the work. But that was okay with me because those people knew that I did it the right way. And I and again, my heart always came from a place of serving. So that's presence. Um, the other piece about it, you know, this is the third uh, video um, that I'll send to you guys. You know, during the time when my when my uh, when I decided to leave was. Um, my second year at University of Portland, 
uh, December, we're heading, we had just, you know, wrapping up our non-conference schedule. My mom got diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. So, you know, here I am, uh, done everything professionally in, in the 10 years prior to get to this place. And a month later, as we're rushing the court, because we had just beaten Gonzaga for the first time in 17 years, Again, one of those euphoric moments that many of you guys on, on the screen are working your tails off for to have that moment. And what I found myself was like asking, like, what the hell am I doing here? Because I had just spent the two days prior in the hospital just making sure, you know, my mom's chemo, chemo treatment, everything, all those things would go well. Um, and so the, the presence piece, you know, it really came home to me. And so... What happened next was, and again, uh, Shenton kind of touched upon it. I have a younger brother who exceeded me professionally. He is a, a James Beard nominated nationally recognized chef in New York City. And he left his profession and he moved back immediately in January. I proceeded to finish out the school year and I left the division one profession, what, seven years ago. Um, and, and took a year off in between coming here and Lake Oswego. Um, the link that I sent you guys, it's actually a video of a TED talk that my brother gives. And he had a, he had a chance to share um, with this huge audience in Portland wh what it is that he was able to do with the restaurant that he came to build out here. And the story that he shares is very similar to the story that we have in our industry, in the restaurant world. So again, imagine like you guys are in the Final Four Conference and you're, again, you've had a great season or some of you maybe one day you're even coaching in it. Uh, my brother had the same kind of ascent. His boss was basically one of the best known chefs in the world. And he got to attend the James Beard Awards every year with her. And he saw time after time, the, per the people who would go in and accept these awards as if for you guys, these coaches are going up to accept the National Coach of the Year Awards. And what struck my brother at that time was that the I'm sorry's were greater than the thank you's that many of them as they were receiving everything in the professional world that they had sought out to do would accept the award and say to the most important people in their lives, I'm sorry that it took so much sacrifice to get here. And that really hit a nerve for my brother to the point where he left the industry. But again, if you guys take a chance to, you know, take a moment, watch video, you'll see that there, there is a happy ending to it because out of that moment of adversity, he was forced to make a choice that, that again, prioritized his family and really led him on a, on a path that everybody in the rest of the industry here in Portland, Oregon are trying to copy. So there it is. Um, and then the last thing, guys, is trust. Um, you know, so I leave University of Portland. You know, I take a year off in between and I finally get this job. Lake Oswego is a big, you know, it's a high profile job in the state, at least. And I know that I'm new to the crowd. I'm new to the community. And so I chose the word trust. You know, am I, am I going to be the person who's going to build a program the right way, earn to trust the community, um, and build this thing to a point where it's going to stand? You know, even if I'm a caretaker and I leave next year, I leave it to one of my assistants, will it be able to stand? You know, again, like we always say, am I going to leave this program better than I found it? Um, you know, what's really interesting, I, you know, some of my closest friends in the, in the profession are on here. Some of the guys that I even look up to, you know, John Yim, uh, I know he's, he presented here recently. Um, he's become a good friend over the years. You know, the first Korean American, um, you know, MBA coach in the NBA, right? You know, Mike, Mike's a good friend of mine. He's the first. Asian American, you know, um, uh, head coach, right, in Division One basketball. I mean, that's that's something that I, I aspire for it, to do at one one point in my life. Um, you know, I think in terms of us earning the trust of each other, like, are we a group, or is this a group of coaches who can ce celebrate the success of another person authentically? You know, it's something that we challenge our players to do, right? If you're building a culture, are you somebody who can celebrate the success of a teammate? At the same time that success is going to have a direct effect on your playing time. Can you still do it? Are you over yourself as, you know, the Spurs culture, Coach Pop would, you know, repeat yourself. Uh, uh, another friend of mine who's not on this, but has become a, a truly a brother of mine is a guy named Steve Beck. He won the national championship at Chino Hills with the Ball Brothers. 
he went on to have you know tremendous success at Fairfax and I'll never forget and I didn't know Steve at the time but I, again this is this is again maybe keeping it 100 and talking about some of the Asian culture in us uh, when Steve won the national championship or, or the national coach of the year award one of my cousins sent me a text and he was he basically said man I wanted that to be you and for that brief second right you have a decision to make right are you gonna let whatever pang or emotion of envy creep into your heart and say yeah man that should have been me or are you the type of person in that moment can tell that person and say no you know cousin Jimmy uh, no this is awesome Steve winning the national coach of the year and being that first Korean American to do it is the best thing that could have ever happened for me. Right. So, you know, I think in that same fashion, um, you know, these are conversations I have with my players daily and I try to drive it home with them. If anybody comes up, coach Willie's on here, uh, from Santa Barbara. If, you know, I have a player that, you know, aspires to be a Santa Barbara, you know, basketball player one day, like he's going to know that this player has been, he has grown up in this culture for the last three years. So at the minimum, he's going to be a person who, who knows that he's a part of something bigger than himself. And again, you know, just to bring that full circle, I think that's something that, again, as we're going through right now, collective, you know, Asian, Asian American or Asian culture in general, you know, we live in a country that's very individualistic, but then by, at least for me, I can speak for myself. I know there's also a lot of, you know, Asian Americans or Asian Australians or, you know, um, who were born and raised here, and maybe your mindset is that of the country that you grew up here in. But for me, having that perpetual feeling of otherness and having to have fought to feel like I have the right to say Lake Cho, um, for me, I'm a collectivist person, I guess, at the end of the day. So I understand that even in this space, you know, I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And, you know, I hope that I'm, I'm passing along that Asian characteristic, that Korean characteristic to my players who are predominantly white, um, have predominantly lived here most of their lives and to use basketball to open up the rest of the world for them so that when they leave this space, they think about issues of social justice. They think about issues of inequality. They think about issues of access, issues of privilege, and things that really matter beyond the basketball court. So that's it. What am I at? 20 minutes, Matt? Is that good? I, I had to do it without my notes. My lights are out. This is... Woo. Keep going. So there you Keep go. Going. Ask away. You know, we, we got a few minutes. Um, if not, you know. Um, if anyone has questions for, for Marsha, go ahead and type them in the chat. Uh, I know I know I have a few. Um, so I, I suppose we can we can kind of start with those. Um, I mean you you've taken a very windy path to get to kind of where you are now. Um, you know, you've kind of spoke already on how your um you know what, what you what you were searching for kind of changed as you've gotten older. Mm -hmm. um, you know how much did you look towards the future at each point in your in your path, or you just kind of just going where the game took you? Um, how much of it actually was was planned? I guess. Yeah, none of it really. Um, yeah, it, it, I get this a lot. You know, um, when I left the University of Portland, I, uh, you know, I I picked up the Twitter habit from Coach Revano. Like he he is like one of the best to do it. Uh, and when I left the UP program, I had that year left. And again, I think a lot of us do this, right? Like we don't have a polo to wear, say what program we're from or whatever affiliation, right? And so for that year, I was a free agent and I really didn't know what my identity would be. And so what I did was in my profile, and I kept it to this day, is I started with where I was born. So Cheju, South Korea. I was born there, but I grew up in Seoul. I moved to Springfield, Oregon. And I went to the University of Oregon. So that was Eugene, Oregon graduated from Oregon. I went to the South Bronx to teach first, spent three years there, even though I was living in Harlem, but South Bronx, I was working 60 days, day week, you know, weeks as a seventh grade math teacher. Um, and then after that, I was, you know, teaching in a charter school in Harlem. That was three years. Mozambique, Shai Shai, which is a, a rural area of, um, of the country. And I was, you know, three hours north of the capital city, Shai Shai, Mozambique was, you know, where I lived. Baltimore, I was in DC, you know, and that, that along that whole journey. So that was 
you know, that was my, I guess, brand or, you know, affiliation or whatever you might call it. But at each of those places, I always approached it that I was going to be there for, for the rest of my life. I, and I authentically believe that. I thought when my first years in the Bronx, I would skip to work with joy because I couldn't believe that I got to do that. You know, some, some country bumpkin, Korean American kid from Eugene Springfield every day, like I was in the, like in the thick of it. Like I was breaking up fights. I was teaching like seven classes a day, hooping with the kids in the black top, like doing home visits in the housing projects. Everything was so fresh and so new and so just exciting that I thought I could do that for the rest of my life. Um, the school closed, the, the city board of ed closed it off. So again, these are things that happened outside of my control. So I ended up teaching at a charter school in Harlem, high performing charter school. We're putting, we're placing all these kids into prep schools all up and down the East coast. We're doing what we promised to do, delivering on the educational experience that, that these kids deserve just as much as the kids that I coach today in Lake Oswego. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And then I, I meet a girl, I meet my wife. She's doing a public health internship, internship or a public health fellowship in Africa. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow her out there. So again, life happens. So at each, at each place, um, you know, it was the, the circumstances kind of, you know, placed me in the, in, in the space that I ended up being. Lake Oswego, I just finished my fifth year here. Obviously, I'm anchored by it. I have a 10-year-old son and seven-year-old daughter. I can do this until they're, they're through high school. You know, I could see myself maybe going back to a collegiate level or you know, trying to hop on with an NBA organization someday. Um, but as long as, you know, I, I'm treating this like the next 20 year job. So again, I'm pretty good at like planting my feet wherever, wherever I'm at, but you know, I'm also open to, you know, being honest to, you know, what opportunities I have to take for my family. Uh, Ben Jay, you have a question? Oh, there, finally. Gonna unmute myself like that. Marcel, how are you doing? Good to see you, Ben. Great to see you. Good to see you too, buddy. Good to see you too. I, I think you just kind of answered my question like that because I was wondering, I said, what, what's the next aspiration for you? You know, where, where do you go from here after, after this position? Yeah, uh, I haven't thought about it. You know, let's be honest. Like, I'm going to be perfectly honest. There might be a parent coming down the the hallway or my AD or somebody saying, Hey, where are you going? But, um, honestly, like I, I do see myself here for the long term. I think at least in the, in the Portland and Oregon picture, you know, we've established our, ourselves as, you know, one of the top programs in the state. I think we're respected for what we do, but again, given the time that we're in right now, um, what I see is I'm trying to figure out an authentic way for us to use the, resources and the financial means that we have in this community and sharing it with the rest of the city you know that might mean you know it's a simple thing like for the last two and a half months I don't know if any other high school program's been doing this but I was running a Monday Wednesday Friday breakfast club you know zoom workout with 30 or so of my players and again you know this is you take things for granted in the place of you know a suburban place of privilege but you know, every kid, for the most part, they have internet access, they have a garage, a quiet place they can go and work at, they have basketballs, they have the, and they, and they have, you know, a hot meal in their belly before they come in. So, you know, those are things that I take for granted. And I, I know that the students that I used to teach in the South Bronx and Harlem and in pockets of Portland don't have that. So how do I get a family here in an authentic way to say, I'm going to give you this access for free. I'm serving your child, but in return, would you, would you donate $20 so that I can go buy that kid a basketball or internet access or whatever? And again, this is in this tribe, you know, I, this isn't something I haven't, I've thought about really making it public, but in our, in our quiet way, you know, serve another in the city. And, and again, I think I'm hoping that by doing that, it's never going to undo the ugly history of us having a nickname like Lake No Negro or, you know, things just even the recent, you know, incident that had happened in response to a Black Lives Matter sign at a house. But the next time they think about Lake Oswego, maybe it's not, that's not what they're thinking of. And they are uh, really, they're thinking, oh, Lake Cho, yeah. And I'm, 
you know, I have to be comfortable enough to, to put myself out there like that. So I think that's going to take some courage. Um, but again, um, I think it's the time, the time is to do it now. Um, so that's the biggest thing I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on. The professional stuff will take care of itself, to be honest with you. So, yeah, that's great, man. Good thing that's, uh, that's, that's a good segue into, uh, into Davin's question. Um, you want to go ahead and ask that? Marshall, um, I, I love the shirt. I really do. I love the segment that you talked about being unapologetic. How much blowback have you gotten from the branding of your program? And if you've gotten any blowback, can you tell us how you've, uh, you've handled that? Yeah. So, you know, um, so, you know, I talked about coach Rev, you know, calling me Chobo for two years. And, you know, the thing that, that I wanted to touch on that for you guys is that, you know, and I think coach saw that I had a potential to be a good coach. Right. But I think at some point it's subliminal to me is that, Hey, Chobo means Dobo means that's what, that's what you are. I think, you know, in this industry, sometimes you can get typecast as that you could get typecast as the guy who's just a recruiter or just a workout guy or the guy who, no, again, just an ops guy. Right. Um, but credit to coach, uh, you know, he has a Stanford degree, master's and undergrad degree for a reason. But, you know, when I got the job in May, you know, uh, he texted me and he goes, Lake Cho, Lake Cho, that's it. Hey, Chris, how's it going? See, there's my boss. I'm on, I'm on this call now. <laughs> I'll hit you up in a minute. Might be down here. Yeah, the light, the light went out. So here I am and this is being recorded. So there's an authentic moment for you guys. Uh, <laughs> I'll circle back with you, boss. Okay. Um, so he said like Cho and I was like, come on coach. That's like corny. Like, don't do that, man. Um, but what happened was so many of my friends were so hype about it. And then as a joke, and some of you guys, ops guys will understand this. If you go to a Nike summer camp, you know, site, you get to just type in whatever. So I was messing around like Lake Cho Swigo, you know, that was out there for a minute, but again, a little corny, but Lake Cho was just an inside joke. And, and I thought to myself, hey, man, there's no harm in that. Like, right. people get that, like, hey, this guy know, knows how to, you know, kind of poke fun at himself, but also kind of send a message that, hey, like, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Um, but, Devin, like, to answer your question, the people who wanted me fired, they absolutely hung on to this shirt and said, this guy is a self-promoter. This guy is just about him. You know, he's not about the kids. Get him out of here. Now, the thing about that is, again, I'm going to be unapologetic. And in my first few years, again, I had relationships in the city. When I got the job, you, you want to talk about trust. So many people came out of the woodworks and said, hey, I want, to, I want my son to transfer into Lake Oswego. I want, I want my son to play for you. And I closed the door and I said, I will not take a transfer, like not in my first few years, because I'm going to earn the trust of the community that the kids who grew up here are going to get a fair shot at trying to make the team. But in the process of doing that, it was a rebuilding process. And in our first year, we were 11 and 14. Our second year, we were 12 and 13. And by that end of that second year, the amount of noise and the amount of, you know, things that try to, people try to use this against me was pretty loud. And I, and I really did underestimate that. But the part about being unapologetic and the, the part about excellence is that the third year, like any of you guys know, that's when coaches should be judged, third or fourth year. And I, I had the confidence in knowing that everywhere I've been professionally, I've won. And I had to hold on to that confidence for myself because that third year, we turned 20 and six, we were top 10 in state. We were a last second possession from getting to the state tournament for the first time in how many years? And the year after that, for my fourth year, we were 24 and five and number one ranked team in the state. And the thing about, thing about that, you know, if you have people who are going to rag on you about the lack of success, and you guys know this, it's been awfully quiet here the last three years, knock on wood. And, and so, yeah, winning, winning cures those ills. But, you know, my eyes are open. I, I, know, I know that that's, again, the, the part about courage, but also knowing who you are. And knowing that, you know, 
that you do things the right way so you can sleep at night. I know that, you know, I haven't heard anything in the last three years, but, um, but yeah, I, you definitely open yourself up to it if you're going to plaster your Asian name all over a t-shirt in, in a community. Coach Lou, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, culture wise, how is like the, the non-whiteness of the white, the non-white kids treated like amongst the general student body in the, is that similar or different within like the basketball program? Mm. Hopefully yeah, I was able question. to make that make sense. Um, well, so are you asking non-whites, non-white student athletes or non-white students, is there a difference? So well, kind of, kind of uh, both. Like, uh, you know, just the random, you know, Japanese kid. Like, how do they maneuver their day to day? How are they treated? How is their, you know, Asianness kind of treated by the general student body? And if that's same or different within the basketball? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have. This is a very unique situation that we have about less than twelve hundred students. But you know, uh, one of the things that I'm proud of is again, I think people. People outside may not recognize it, but I, I think it is the Korean in me or the collectivist in me and that I want to include everybody in a sport in our school that's naturally exclusive. You know, everybody wants to be a basketball star, right? Everybody wants to be, play a sport where their face isn't covered by a hat or a mask or a helmet. Um, so we have five teams, which is not common. We have a freshman A, freshman B, JV, JV1, JV2, and a varsity team. Um, and so there's about 55 kids in the program in any given year. And out of that, I would say the students that are, could be classified as students of color are maybe four or five. Um, and I think I, I can, I don't teach in the building, so I can't really speak for the other pieces, but I can tell you, I know there's a lot more Koreans in this building because again, this is a part, this is the number one ranked academic high school in the state. So, you know, there are, are going to be a lot of Asian American, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, Indian Americans who are, you know, who seek out this community to get that kind of, you know, public education. But I only have one Korean American player in my basketball program. And again, that speaks to many of your experiences because I'm sure many of you guys went to your parents and said, hey, I'm going to be a basketball coach. And they said, you're supposed to be a doctor, lawyer, or banker. Like, what are you doing? So, you know, I, I experienced that here, um, at least for the kids that are in my program. We talk about race, we talk about identity. The, the poor kid, the one Korean kid, he doesn't speak any Korean. And then sometimes I'll come up to a practice and I'll just start speaking in Korean. I'll turn to, I'll turn to the player and say like, don't you agree, right? We're doing this, right? And, uh, and you know, but it's challenging him out of his comfort zone. But you know, if I, if I can authentically talk about it, Will, I think again, one of the things that we have in our program that we adopted the last two years is truth fears no question. So in order for us to coach, um, that's, that's a huge piece of our culture that, that we're able to talk about things that, you know, honestly, openly and, you know, and ongoing so that, you know, sometimes a 14 year old doesn't get a certain lesson, the first conversation around, but as long as we keep with it, you know, hopefully something will stick before they graduate. Great, um, and then uh, Coach Mike. Uh, yeah, um, actually Marshall, one of the things that you said that's really ringing true with me is to celebrate each other. Because one thing that, and maybe you've experienced this coach, is that like for instance myself, I'll just give you an example of being, the, this is the first month in this seat and, and, and coach, you, you went through it when you got that job like Oswego, like a lot of people think they can do this job. Mm. That a lot of people just whatever you can you can sense it you can smell you can smell you can kind of see that you can if you have any kind of sense you can sense the the sincere supporters of you and you can you can kind of sense the the people who are haters whatever it's actually Coach Katani that when I called him the day I got the job that was one of the, that was one of the reasons why he told me to call every high school coach in Southern California for that reason know who the, the guys are behind you and know who the guys that are that are hating because everybody thinks they can do the job yeah. so my question. For, which is why we do have to celebrate each other. We have to celebrate each other and support each other. But my question for you, just stick to the basketball part of your first two years, having that record, those records, like 
how did you how did you stay positive with it and how did you keep that confidence that you talked about like and then how did you push through if you're a twitter guy how did you push through all that twitter the twitter critics and, and and all that stuff that was coming your way undoubtedly those first two years yeah you know i i don't think there was you're going to experience a lot more obviously given the d1 world and the message boards and all that stuff you know uh the criticism and really, I didn't get it in Twitter. You know, it was all usually behind the scenes, right? Um, and so the biggest thing for me is I knew that, uh, I thought about this a lot, you know, um, when my parents came, right, in 1986, and this is like, this is, I don't want this to be like some corny, like general answer to it, but, you know, for me to be the child of parents who left the country, right, and there was no going back to Korea, like we're here, man. And so when I came at a young age, and it was rare that I ran across issues where, you know, a kid would say, hey, go back to China. And then the whole conversation, hey, man, I'm not Chinese. Like, what are you talking about? But I wasn't going to go anywhere, right? And so I think at an early age, you just learn to stick it out and you work your ass off, right? Um, same thing, you know, when I was in the South Bronx my first year, uh, I, I tell the story a lot. You know, it was one of the worst performing middle schools in the entire city. Uh, the class before the as a group of sixth graders, these kids had gone through three different teachers that they chased away, right? And the teachers quit. And for me, there wasn't going to be any quit, right? Like they tested me, but like I persevered through those three years. And, and so the biggest thing is like for all of us in the coaching profession, knowing that, hey, I just got to get to year three because I know it's going to turn, right? But at the core is knowing that I had lived through it in my parents, to my own professional career before I was a coach, and then once I became a coach. Um, which reminds me, there's one link I didn't give you guys, and this is the, this is a famous speech that Eddie Huang, uh, the guy who, you know, I think he was the guy who helped write, you know, Fresh Off the Boat, he, Bauhaus, like he's a, he's a chef. And this is kind of my FU list or FU swagger, you know, that Shenton even talks about is he gave the speech in January right after Donald Trump was elected in the end of 2016. And he goes to the space and it's about a 10 minute YouTube talk. And he, he talks about how uh, no coupons at his restaurant. And there's some sound bites in there. I think as immigrant families, you know, we're told that we have to work three times as hard. You know, if, you, if we want people to come eat at our Korean restaurant or Chinese restaurant, you have to throw out coupons. And Eddie Huang basically says, F that. Like I'm charging the full price, you know? And I think for me, like, I know I'm overqualified for this job and that's not a bragging thing. I just know it. I, I put in my dues. I, I've worked three times as hard as everybody else to make it where I am. And I think that's, a, that's the kind of swagger I would like for you guys to have and say, well, you know what? I'm charging full price. You don't get to chase me away from this spot. And, and, and the last piece of that, Mike, Again, in the state of Oregon, I'm, you know, I don't know how many Asian American head coaches are there in varsity sports. So I know, again, understanding that I'm a part of something bigger than myself, I wasn't going to quit. I had to make it. Right. So there's some stubbornness to it. There's some swagger. There's some FU in there somewhere. But those, that attitude helped me get through it. And there were some dark days. I'm no lie. Like people, People attack my integrity and made lies and things of that nature. But I knew that again, truth would come out and truth would fear no question. Just like the lack of Asian American athletic administrators across the country. <laughs> any, uh, any final questions for Coach Cho? Hey, I've got something. Uh, Hey, Marshall, thanks, man. Appreciate you. Steve Yang here. Uh, thanks for jumping on, man. And I can just tell your, your energy and, and your, your passion is, is there, man. I, I appreciate you very much. And I think uh, I can speak for Mike, too, and all of us that. Thank you for your time. Um, this has been great. Um, I, I have a lot of questions, but I, I'm always the one with questions, I think. But one question I want to have is I, I think for the viewers and listeners out there, um, what what advice can you give them just not i mean all the the, the fu list and all that stuff but what advice can you give them for someone who just wants to be around the game in a sense where um 
if, if you're an Asian minority and all that, because um, I know there's a handful of Asian minorities out there that kind of looks at their Asian side and kind of looks past that. Um, what, what advice can you give for those out there who has that, I guess, that's on the fence, that has to look at themselves and say, all right, what do I do? I'm, I'm looking myself in the mirror. Like, it's not really picking a side in a sense, but we, we have to really do face that. And I struggle with that too sometimes growing up. And then all of a sudden you're like, are you white? Or are you black? What's, what's going on? But someone like yourself uh, in this profession, what, what advice do you have for those listeners out there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I know and not every, every uh, person listening in, you know, is Asian American here as well. And I, I think it's just at the end of the day, you have to know who you are, right? And finding, you know, under, I, I just think at the end of the day, understanding who you are allows you to get to your place where you have your own coaching philosophy and, and be able to do that. But, you know, I think that's part of what I was, you know, want to share with the group is that I didn't always have that kind of confidence, right? So I think that's what you're touching on, Steve, is like, how do you get that foot in the door? How do you get, you know? And so with, to that, I just have to say, you know, um, the, the best advice I've gotten, and again, I, you know, we all do this, we read books, we read podcasts, and we have access, you know, try to get access to people that we don't get to meet face to face. But the comment that I, you know, the line that always stuck with me is Kevin Neesman gave a talk once and he's, he said, never turn down a basketball opportunity, right? And so early on in my career, that was everything. So I never, I didn't turn down the opportunity to coach the charter school team at Harlem when my principal just dropped off a bag of balls and said, you're the coach. So I did that, got my reps in. You know, when I went to uh, move to Mozambique, I knew that I was going to a place, Portuguese, former Portuguese colony, I don't speak the language. But turns out there's a basketball with that borders ran by the NBA being held in Johannesburg. So that meant I had to seek out that opportunity, hop on a bus, five hour drive from Maputo to Johannesburg. And I, you know, I show up, knock on the door, they let me in. Next thing I know, I'm, you know, in the rebounding and shop walking station with Manu Bull and Dikembe Mutombo, you know. And so just, you just keep collecting those stories. I think, or those experiences, the basketball experiences that you seek out, whatever you can get and make the most of it. But eventually, like anything else, you know, like what Shenton did, like, I'm sure if I were to make a PowerPoint, you can get to a bullet point, and you can start to see patterns. And I think the, the biggest thing that I did once I got the experience was told myself, I need to go get a master's degree in coaching. No such thing exists. So for me, that meant, you know, when I got the opportunity to be on the part of the Matthew Catholic staff, three years that I commuted from Baltimore to DC, which is an hour each way, uh, reverse traffic, but still an hour, two hours out of the day. Um, I try to make that, turn that into my master's degree. And so the, one of the best advice that Coach Jones gave me is, hey, you don't want to be just known as a recruiter or the film guy or this guy. Like even for Mike, uh, Mike Jones back in those days, he said, I'm still young enough. I want to do it all. And, you know, I think many years later, Coach Jones has gotten better about delegating to his, you know, huge staff of 11, 12 coaches. But what I got to see with Mike Jones firsthand was him doing a lot of the stuff, right? And so that allowed me to, you know, say, hey, like, I'm going to step into a space. I can cut film. I can order hotel meals, but I can also work out a guy, but I can also game plan. Like, I try to be that guy that could do everything. Um, and in that sense, you know, I might not be like Shenton where I have a 50 page, you know, <laughs> is he still here? You know, 50 page, uh, slide, but I can, I'm a jack of all trades, you know, and if I'm not an expert in something because I'm the head coach, I can hire a guy and delegate that guy to be the expert. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, that's the biggest thing. And then again, I think if you find a community like this, or if you find somebody who's an encourager, stick to them, you know. Uh, I have a five o'clock call, so I have to get off soon, but it's with the Snow Valley coaches, you know, and I, I think some of you guys know, this, you know, know this name, Mike Dunlap, who was recently the head coach at LMU. Uh, you know, there are people like that, the people who are, there are givers and take, and in the basketball industry, there are definitely givers who know that they have to give back to the game. You know, Mike Dunlap, for example, I just got a, you know, I got a mutual contact. He was an assistant in Oregon. I called him up. I was at the math at the time. I go down to see him. For two hours, you know, I explained the situation. Hey, I'm commuting both ways from Baltimore, D.C. He stops me right there and goes, hey, like, what are you doing? What about all your time with your family, your wife? Like, and he proceeds to give me two hours of his day, and none of it had to do with basketball. It had to, everything to do with what he did to maintain his relationship with his wife, with his kids, how he balanced his schedule. It was, he spent two years just talking to me about life. 
right? Um, and so if you find people like that, you know, I think you, you know, you have to stick close to them and try to learn from them as much as possible. Awesome. Well, Marshall, man, we, we really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, great, great message for everybody to hear. Shenton as well, man. Thank you so much um, for your uh, in-depth uh, insight into your, uh, your position as well. Um, you know, with that, uh, Mike, you want to wanna go ahead and kind of close us out? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Marshall, that was awesome, man. Um, you have a really great spirit and soul about the way that you approach your work and, and, and it really came through here. Um, what I took, I mean, there's so many things that it's crazy because every single one of these, like, I end up taking a page of notes, but being upon apologetic about who you are, that's kind of the, the, the main message that I took from this from, for the whole thing, Shenton and you today. Um, and like, and I'll just throw this out there. Who cares? really probably know but like even in this the contract negotiations that i'm going through like you got to know your value and 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 stick to it and believe in it and have confidence in it so um and the other thing marshall that i really believe in that you said is is uh what impact what impact did you leave when you were at that place and it's just like the first guy that i ever worked for kyle smith he was a big believer in that like live close to campus be that guy and um I, I really, really do take that to heart. I love Riverside. I love UC Riverside. I love everything about it. I know every restaurant here. I mean, I, I just, I'm a big believer in that. And I think that's what's taken you so far, Marshall. And um, it's awesome, man, all the way to the, the heights of USA basketball. Um, and then just talking about Shenton, like the main message that I took away from Shenton, and especially because we got a lot of young dudes here that are trying to get into this and, and always asking is that you got to take risks. And you got to work for free and you're going to be chopping away and hammering away at that thing. And then all of a sudden it's going to break for you. And we will do that because uh, I don't know if anybody reads Malcolm Gladwell, but that whole idea of 10,000 hours, it takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to be world-class at, at what you do. And to me, that's what we do. I mean, that's why we're all here and that's why we've all made it this to, to where we are in our respective professions so um thank you marshall thank you shenton um next week we have another we got two head coaches we got uc merced head coach kevin fam and we have a uh, new head coach kira carter um speaking so this thing just keeps rolling i can't believe we still get this many people on and it's awesome so just thank you guys for coming and ben jay good to see you welcome to the big west appreciate it um and okada great job coach thank you so much and thank you, Furubayashi. Hopefully we get to see you next week, Garrett. Awesome. See you guys. Thanks, guys.